In 1223 shortly after the Battle of the Kalka River between the Mongols and various Rus principalities, a group of Russian men are traveling through the forest to hunt. Two of them have brought their children, Nastya a girl that likes to play the flute, and Kolovrat a boy that dreams of becoming a warrior, and the prince's guard. Unfortunately they're suddenly ambushed by a group of Mongolian soldiers led by Commander Kostovrol. After losing her flute Nastya takes a horse to town to ask for help while Kolovrat stays back trying to fight as well. All the Russian men are killed and Kolovrat grabs two swords to defend himself, but before he can do anything, Kostovrol throws Bolas at his neck and knocks him out. Fourteen years later an adult Kolovrat wakes up tied to a bed with no memories and freaks out. Older Nastya is used to this reaction and rushes to his side to explain everything. The Mongols had left him for dead so Kolovrat got to survive. Now he's a foreman in the prince's guard he's married to Nastya, and they've had two children together. Hearing these words and walking around the house helps Kolovrat remember. But he doesn't even get to have breakfast before one of his soldiers Karkin comes to pick him up to go to the city walls. When they arrive there Prince Yuri of Ryazan asks Kolovrat for his advice on what to do about the men on horses that are approaching the city because they can't see their flags yet. Kolovrat tells them to wait before attacking and this turns out to be the smart thing to do. It's not the Mongols it's another prince and his men that have come for the christening of Yuri's grandson. Afterward Kolovrat takes over the training of the soldiers. Yuri's son Fedor arrives late because he was busy with the preparations for the christening of his son of whom Kolovrat will be the godfather. Kolovrat asks him to show his skills and Fedor gladly takes the challenge, but he only ends up embarrassing himself and leaving. Once training is over Kolovrat returns home with gifts for his family, a little hedgehog for his kids, and a new flute for his wife that he's carved himself. Nastia loves it and puts it in a box to keep it safe. But inside that box Kolovrat finds dozens of flutes, because he's carved one for her every day and keeps forgetting about it. Later the christening ceremony is interrupted by a citizen announcing that the Mongols are coming. Everyone runs to hide but Kolovrat stays with the baby until the priest is done with his blessing. After Yuri and his men notice the huge amount of soldiers the Mongols are bringing, they give orders to close the gates and not let anyone leave until they decide what to do. The prince holds a meeting to discuss the problem. Fedor thinks that their Russian warriors are better so they could defeat the Mongols even while outnumbered. While other advisors think they should pay tribute, this would leave the city poor but at least they would survive. Yuri decides to buy time to see if they can ask neighboring cities for help. So he wants Fedor to take the best guards and go negotiate with the Mongols. Meanwhile Kolovrat leaves the meeting in the middle of it to check the state of the city where everyone is panicking and running to find shelter. He bumps into a medicine man called Zahar that begs Kolovrat to allow him to go out in exchange for potions, but Kolovrat reminds him that the city is surrounded and there's no escape. Afterward he returns home only to find Yuri there with an order. Kolovrat must gather his men and go with Fedor to see the Mongols. Kolovrat doesn't think it's a good idea because of his memory issues and Nastya agrees with him, breaking down into tears and begging the prince to reconsider. However Kolovrat is the man Yuri trusts the most so he doesn't change his mind. The soldiers gather near the gates to get going. Karkin is going as well and since they'll need a translator. Kolovrat chooses Zahar to come too because he understands the Mongols' language. Still worried about her husband Nastya brings over their maid Lada, who just learned how to help Kolovrat in the mornings, so she can go with him while Nastya stays home with the kids. Once their wagon is loaded with riches the group takes off and travels to the Mongolian camp, where they're directed to the tent of their leader Bata Khan grandson of Genghis Khan. Their offerings are well received so they're invited to sit and share some drinks, and they take the chance to ask the Mongols what they want. Bata Khan says he wants nothing and the Russians came uninvited, but he's curious about their people so he'll have Ryazan as his first Russian city. Every man that kneels to Bata Khan will be well fed, but Fedor replies by saying he wants to see Bata Khan kneel instead. This is taken as an insult so Kolovrat stands up and comes in Fedor's defense announcing their city will only be taken over their dead bodies. Bata Khan claims he'll never kneel for anyone but he respects Kolovrat's guts. So he gifts him a talisman with a letter of transit. This letter allows a person to walk through enemy territory without being attacked or harassed. Then Bata Khan invites them to watch a little show while they enjoy their drinks. This is a trick to distract the Russians so the Mongols can ambush them but the plan doesn't work. The table is being held by Russian slaves, and they see the Mongols approach so they warn their countrymen just in time. A fight ensues and Kolovrat takes everyone out of the tent including the slaves. And they slash their way through a bunch of soldiers in order to steal some horses and run to the forest. Sadly Fedor is hit by an arrow so he decides to stay behind to buy his friends some time, and is killed by Kostovrol. 
Batacon doesn't think they're worth pursuing, and orders the horde to get ready for an attack instead. A few hours later Kalavrat's group is having trouble crossing the forest because of an extreme snowstorm. Suddenly they're approached by a giant bear, but the animal doesn't attack because it's under the control of fellow Russian Nestor. This man takes them to a huge cave so they can rest until the storm is over. But Kalavrat refuses to sleep and asks Nestor for a potion that can keep him awake for the sake of his memories. However Nestor refuses to prepare such a thing because he thinks waking up every morning with no memories is a blessing that lets you start your life anew. Kalavrat tries his best to stay awake in front of the fire and realizes he still remembers the map he saw back in the tent, so he writes it down before he forgets. Once the weather calms down the group leaves, leaving Nestor behind in his cave, however by the time they return to Riazan it's too late. The Mongols have already destroyed the city. Most of the buildings have been hit by catapults. The main bell has fallen from its rope. Yuri was killed by archers. Fedor's wife decided to jump with the baby before getting caught. And Nastia with the kids stayed in the house until it collapsed from a fire. After finding the flute he carved among the ruins of his home. Kalavrat gathers his men and together they raise the bell again to make it ring so any survivors will come out from their hideouts. There aren't many people left and various of these survivors are children. Suddenly someone announces that the Mongols are coming to finish them off so Kalavrat quickly makes a plan. While everyone hides he stays under the bell and pretends to let the Mongols capture him. But as soon as they come closer Kalavrat attacks. His dual wielding of two swords in a circular motion is extremely effective and kills many enemies in seconds. And once Kalavrat has lowered their numbers his men come out and help him finish them off. Now that the fight is over Kalavrat comes up with a plan. He sends three messengers to warn the neighboring cities and ask for their help. And the children will be sent to hide in Nestor's cave. Kalavrat and the soldiers will try to make the horde turn around and keep them distracted. They only need to figure a way to do that. Thankfully Zahar has an idea. He prepares a special potion that they pour into the water the Mongols are drinking from making them all sick. To make sure they get the message Kalavrat tears off part of the letter of transit and ties it to an arrow that he shoots at the camp for Kostovril to find. The commander sends some soldiers after Kalavrat's group to get revenge for the water but it's all a trap. The Russian soldiers are expecting them and easily kill them with their arrows. Once they're safe Kalavrat passes out, not being able to stay awake any longer after three days of not sleeping. While the group sets up camp Lada ties Kalavrat to a tree and watches over him while praying to the gods that he falls for her. When night falls Lada wakes Kalavrat up so he can eat something. However she unties him before she's done reciting all the important facts for him to remember so Kalavrat escapes and attacks his friends. It takes quite a number of men to hold him down. And it's thanks to Karkin's words that Kalavrat comes to his senses. Then Kalavrat apologizes to his brothers in arms and comforts a crying Lada. Meanwhile two messengers safely leave the area and reach the neighboring cities, but when they talk to the princes they refuse to help preferring to stay behind and protect their homes. The third messenger is hurt and passes out on top of the horse so the animal gets lost and takes the wrong road. The following night Kalavrat and his men sneak inside the Mongolian camp wearing costumes and face paint to make them think they're spirits. Some soldiers run away and the Russians kill the ones that don't to then use the catapults to attack the Mongols with their own weapons. Before leaving Kalavrat leaves another arrow with a piece of the letter so Kostovril knows who did this. As revenge the Mongols capture the lost messenger to torture him. Kalavrat and his men hide in the forest and go to sleep early confident that they'll get help in the morning. Lada tries to lay down next to Kalavrat unaware he's awake. So when he turns to look at her she thinks he's waking up and begins reciting the memories. This includes pretending to be Nastia but Kalavrat calls out her lie before hugging her and reminding her she's all he's got left from home. When morning comes Kalavrat goes deeper into the forest to check some weird noises unaware that Lada is following him. That's how he finds the third messenger's dead body which was left there as a trap. Now Kalavrat finds himself surrounded by Mongols. While Lada runs back to camp to ask for help Kostovra watches with a how Kalavrat fights all the soldiers on his own as a snowstorm begins blowing around him. The commander tries to stop him with his bolus like he did years ago. But this time Kalavrat stops them with his sword. As the storm gets worse Nestor and the bear arrive killing a bunch of Mongols and scaring the survivors away. When the soldiers return to their camp they tell terrifying stories of what they just saw. Kostovril hadn't believed the trick of the spirits. But now he's seen Kalavrat command a storm and a bear he's starting to believe as well. Batacon is disappointed by his men for believing such things and orders his army to turn around determined to find a way to prove there's nothing magical about this war. Back to the Russians Nestor frees the bear and joins Kalavrat's army. He's also brought a few men with him from nearby villages. The group celebrates when Karkin returns with some good news. Just like they planned the Mongols are turning around and following them instead of going after the other cities.
there's only one problem left. The sleigh full of children Nestor had been taken care of in his cave. Following Zahar's idea Kalavrat decides that the group will stay behind and hold the line while Karkin takes Lada and the children to the river. There they can host the sail on the sleigh and travel faster than any horse. This way the survivors can rebuild a new Riazan in the future. After the sleigh leaves the men begin working on various traps and wait at the top of a hill for the Mongols to arrive. When Badakhan finally gets there he brings an immense army with him and wastes no time in sending some men after the Russians. This first attack fails because the soldiers fall for the traps and the archers, which make it difficult for the Mongols to climb up the hill. Meanwhile Karkin finds the road blocked so he frees the horse and asks Lada and the kids to help him push the sleigh through. The battle at the hill continues. The Mongols shoot their arrows too, and after taking down a few Russians, they finally climb up and begin fighting Kalavrat's men hand to hand. Nestor and Zahar die while Kostovil comes for their leader, but Kalavrat easily defeats him with a clean cut of his two swords. The Mongols still outnumber them though so the Russian soldiers slowly fall one by one, but at least they protect the hilltop long enough for Karkin to reach the river. However he finds a little problem, the knot around the sail is frozen, and they don't have any fire. Lada makes the kids breathe over the frost which frees the rope, and allows them to release the sail, so now they can escape safely. With only a few men left Kalavrat defeats the remaining Mongols at the top of the hill, and puts up his flag. Badakhan feels like they're being ridiculed, and sends a messenger to find out what the Russians want. But Kalavrat gives him back the same words they received a few days ago. They want nothing and the Mongols came here uninvited. As a furious Badakhan orders his men to fire the catapults. Kalavrat notices the sleigh sail at the river celebrating the survivors have managed to escape right before he's knocked out by a rock. When he wakes up seconds later Kalavrat has all his memories but finds all his men dead. As a last honorable move he goes down the hill protecting himself from any attack by showing the talisman. Kalavrat falls to the ground and tells Badakhan one day his people will have their revenge. Then drops the talisman on the snow asking the Mongolian leader to take it back. Badakhan does as asked and Kalavrat smirks. Pointing out he did make Badakhan kneel for him after all before dying. Badakhan is impressed by Kalavrat's heroics saying this would be the warrior he trusted the most if he were one of his. Then asks his men to give him a hero's burial. Five years later Karkin is the leader of the Novgorod Vladimir army. He inspires his men by reminding them of Kalavrat's sacrifice and noble fight before guiding them into what would become known as the battle on the ice. Thanks for your interested and watching.